let me bring out my fantastic panel about education. Have a seat, everyone. Go ahead, and they, these are the superstars. Wait till you hear their stories and give them a big round of applause. For sake of time, because I want to make it about their stories, let me just introduce who is on our, my fantastic panel. This is Dr. Julia Brodsky. Uh, she, uh, among being many things, she's astrophysicist, has trained people for the ISS. Uh, her kind of projects right now are Art of Inquiry and Earthlings Hub. Of course, Lee Giot Passage, wait till you hear this kid's story. He's only 24 and again, doing massively amazing things. Then we have the lovely Kim Macharia, who of course with Space Prize Foundation did a lovely job moderating our Not So Hidden Figures panel this AM. And then, a doctoral candidate, an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow, Mr. Christine, uh, Mrs. Christine Bernhardt. All right, everybody make them welcome. Again, because I said they're superstars. So first off, Julia, tell your story. Uh, welcome, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Janet and all of the organizers of this incredible event and I'm so glad to see you all here. Today we are going to talk about uh, space education, and besides me being an astrophysicist and former NASA astronaut instructor, I'm also a mom of three kids and a long-term educator. And I'm really worried about what we should do to help our children to survive and thrive in this fast-changing, complex, and unpredictable world. So I turned for answers to space education. Not only space education instills hope and inspiration, it also nurtures our ability to adapt to unfamiliar realms. It embraces profound, open-ended questions it encourages us to reconsider our place in the universe. It promotes global cooperation, unlocks new opportunities, helps to educate our children to consider the world from a planetary standpoint. It cultivates world-building skills and helps our children to grow to be the guardians of this world. In essence, it empowers the younger generation to take an active part in shaping the destiny of human civilization. And maybe above all, the most important thing is that it brings, helps to bring additional meaning to a child's life here and now. And as you see, uh, I'm quoting one of my 12-year-old students here. It brings us together. So several years ago, I started the Art of Inquiry program to discuss profound questions of life, science, and universe with children all over the globe. And I also joined the fantastic community of Blue Marble Space Institute of Science uh, which is focused on promoting a uh, sustainable future and nurturing scientific interest among public. Right now, my students and colleagues at Blue Marble are teaching space science to kids and adults on all continents of this planet. So, I got completely devastated when the war in Ukraine started. Um, this war disrupted the life of millions of children. And you can just imagine how it feels when you have to drop everything and run with your children into nowhere. Um, 3,000 schools in Ukraine are in ruins right now. These children have no home. They have no support, no routine, no predictability. So we got together with some incredible people, 
from space community and from educational community and started the Earthlings Hub, <laughs> an online educational program for refugee kids in Ukraine. So these are some of the members of our team. You can see former NASA astronaut Greg Shamitov and some space science researchers and AI developers and leading educators and psychologists from the USA, Canada, Europe, and Ukraine. So since the beginning of the war, we reached out to thousands of orphans and refugee kids. We taught thousands of hours of classes. And children, they connect to the classes from train stations. They connect to the classes from cold and wet bomb shelters. No one requires them to come. But they continue coming because by coming to these classes, they find new friends, they build new knowledge, they regain their hope and meaning of their life, they dream. These classes help them to stay fully alive, despite what's happening in their lives. So we, the educators in the space communities, I'm not going to let them down. And we hope that space education stays a beacon of hope and unity for all of us. Thank you. When I met uh, Julia a few, few weeks ago uh, via a Zoom meeting for the first time, what astounded me is she said that some of the kids uh, who are in different places and you know bomb shelters, train stations, actually apologize for being late. So again, it matters what we do in the lives of our children. Now, here's Lee to tell his story. All right, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lee Giat and I am a pilot and a filmmaker. On the screen there, you can see that's my beautiful little airplane, uh, known now by many as the Spirit of Science. And um, I wanna tell you about a little adventure that I had with this airplane. Um, but before I do, uh, my full-time job is, uh, as I said, a filmmaker. I run a video production company called Flying Ostrich Media in Florida. And uh, we do a lot of corporate work. We do a lot of documentary work um, and AV production and uh, have an amazing team. Some of these photos were actually last week. And um, I got to use my profession and what I do. My background in, in life has always been in video production ever since I was a baby filming with my mom's camera. And um, I got my degree in uh, multimedia production at the University of North Florida. And um, as for my aviation side, uh, I want to tell you about an adventure I had called PASSAGE. Um, it's an acronym. It stands for Providing Aid in Science for South America's General Education. And I started this in the midst of um, the pandemic. And uh, in addition to you know, all of the other challenges that came with it, um, my father, who taught me how to fly from a young age, um, unfortunately passed away in a plane crash. And it was just you know, another layer to that onion of, of 2020, a very difficult time for, for many of us. And I, you know, with all of this time at home, I decided, hey, you know, there's a lot of negative energy here. Let me see if I can channel it to try and do something good. And one thing led to another. And two years later, December 3rd, 2022, I departed on this two-month journey across the Caribbean and South America. And uh, the goal was to fill the spirit of science with thousands and thousands of dollars. We ended up raising over $50,000. Um, we actually shoved a bunch of Janet's Planet uh, kits in there and a bunch of boxes that we would take to uh, six different countries. Uh, we had um, 30 outreach events, over 20,000 kids attended our events. And this was totally solo. I was the only person in the plane, uh, mainly to make room and, and wait for all of this cargo um, that we would take. And here are some of the pictures. As you can see, we even got the fire, firefighter salute there in uh, uh, Paipa, Colombia. 
And um, it was just an amazing time, met with uh, presidents and ministers of education. And um, the, at the bottom of the screen there, you can see those are John Reed's books. I don't know if uh, maybe some of you are familiar. He's the best-selling astronomy author on Amazon. He translated his best-selling books to Spanish and rotated the sky maps for the Southern Hemisphere for some of our schools. So this was just an amazing project that involved so many people putting their, their two cents in and, 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 and their hands onto this, and it just turned out absolutely incredible. Um, but it didn't come without its challenges uh, from an aviation perspective. Um, there were some, some things I had to prepare for. So what you're seeing there, that's a, a scale model of my airplane and um, a, a regular runway. Uh, you know, this is a pretty average uh, length and width of a runway. And then this is what I had to land on in Colombia. <laughs> It is uh, one of the narrowest runways in the world, and uh, the, the width you see is 20 feet. My wingspan is 40 feet. So any gust of wind, any wrong move, and my wheels were off into the dirt, and it was kind of sloped down on the side, so that would have not been a good day. We did have a situation there that, that ended up a little bit of an emergency, um, but I'll get to that in just a little bit. Probably the most complicated and, and risky thing I had to do was uh, across the Andes. This is a piston-powered airplane, you know, just like your car engines. It does not displace air very efficiently compared to the jets um, and the turboprop-powered airplanes or rocket engines. And uh, it has a maximum service ceiling. It'll fly up to a certain point and then just, it, it will not climb anymore. So that altitude for this airplane is 25,000 feet. And it's not insulated, it doesn't have any fancy heaters or anything like that. So I'm sitting there with nothing but an oxygen mask um, at negative 30 degrees, uh, you know, just trying to, to stay calm. It is, I, I cannot explain or describe how uncomfortable this was when you see ice crackling on the windows, uh, when you feel your organs expanding from the inside out. Uh, it's not a pressurized airplane uh, like you do when you're flying. This is airline altitude we're talking, and uh, it's right over some pretty harsh terrain at uh, 21,000 feet. So even though I've climbed all this time uh, to this, this, the maximum altitude that, that me or the airplane could possibly go, um, I am still maybe three, 4,000 feet off the ground, or from the ground. So um, if I lost an engine, I don't know if the airplane would even hold that altitude. So. It was a lot of planning, it was two years uh, to plan for those two months that, that I was away. And um, I'm privileged to have been the one to represent all of the people. Many of you are in this room that, that have uh, been a part of this project. Um, Janet as well, thank you so much for, for everything, making this, this possible. And um, I got to use my video production background to fly out some of my team to produce a documentary series called Rite of Passage. As you can see, Wright, like the Wright brothers. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> um, and uh, they followed me on a bunch of different um, uh, stops that I had to go on. I had cameras all over the airplane as well. And we are premiering this at Kennedy Space Center on June 17th. So that's coming up here shortly. So thank you. And um, uh, I guess I will just leave you with the trailer, it's about a two minute trailer, so uh, if there's popcorn, grab it and enjoy the show. <laughs> no one loves flying more than my dad. Look at this, look at this heaven. Two people were killed when the plane flew right. Ever since I lost him, it's been really hard not to think about the crash. I know the second I get back in the airplane, I have to put it all behind me until I come home. A mission two years in the making is now a reality. That's a lot of people. In Latin America, in general, of 10 students who enter the first year of education secondary, only five. A plane called the Spirit of Science, and I'm flying it all across Latin America, bringing school supplies and STEM education resources to underprivileged kids. They dare not to dream because they don't know how far their dream will go. The oh. nebula is right there. Uh, did it jam? Did it jam? I fell in love with talking to people about space. To see the excitement on their faces, the spark that curiosity. And sometimes even like the teachers and the adults to like, oh, I didn't know that. Really? Like, yeah. Oh, what the? It's that spark, you know? Oh, I can see the light! I see it! 
he does not give up. If there's any way to, to take something positive out of a tragedy like this, he works even harder. This, this is the reason I left NASA. La verdad me gustó mucho esta misión, ya que muchos creen que las mujeres no pueden ser científicas, y sí se puede. I'm hoping we can use this to send a message to young people that you really are our future. Everyone thinks I know what I'm doing, but at the end of the day, I don't know if I'm coming home. This is chaos on chaos. Hi, my heart rate's getting a little fast. You should calm down. Any problem over there? Do you need help? Something happens, he dies alone, and I'm... And he does. Ha sido una de las experiencias más hermosas de mi vida. ¿Qué más que eso? Ya está. Espera, no, no. So, uh, if anybody wants uh, more information about the premiere, come find me uh, afterwards. Thank you, guys. Ah, oh, beautiful work. Ah, so this is why we do it. You can see the excitement. So Kim from Space Prize, tell your story, my friend. Thank you. I still, I still have chills from that trailer. That was beautiful. Wow. Um, I think storytelling is such an important aspect of us getting this message of the, the value and relevance of space out to young people. My journey began with storytelling. I had a screenwriting fellowship for a couple of years in college, and my last script was inspired by a space camp jacket I got from a thrift store. And I wrote this musical comedy about two women competing for a free trip to space, knowing very little about space science and just about no one in the industry. And when I was writing this script, my two main characters were these young immigrant women. And I was, as I was developing their characters and doing research, I came to really understand the inequities that exist in the space sector, especially around women, where you know 20% of the industry's workforce is made up of women, and around 11% or maybe less are of astronauts who've been to space are women. And so there was a lot of room for growth there. And I thought, huh, how can I, how can I make a slight contribution to that? And I started to explore these ideas as a philosophy student, wrote my senior thesis about democratizing space, and decided to try and get some position in the industry to make a difference. And a couple months after I graduated, I was working on a space debris project. We were trying to educate young people about how they can make contributions to this global issue uh, from the comfort of their homes, doing uh, uploading data to an open uh, data set. And so after getting the chance to work on that and actually start to make some solid contributions to space, I started to want to really get the message of why space matters out to the world. And within about a year of me working in industry, I found myself speaking at the UN World Space Forum about that message. And it was such an incredible honor. And I've been able to carry that mission forward in a lot of different projects. And one that I'm especially excited about is Space Prize. And I remember, funny enough, I had gotten a call about someone who wanted to launch a nonprofit geared around women that was about creating contests to get young women excited about space. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how do, do you know my backstory? Do you know how I got in this industry? And uh, I ended up getting the chance to launch a fantastic contest in New York City for our pilot program. Where we gave away a zero-G flight to a girl in every borough, or one girl in each borough, so five girls. They got a year of mentorship. And as that project was beginning to develop and expand and we were getting girls excited about applying, we had so many lovely partners coming up to offer amazing in-kind contributions. We were able to get some free space camp trips from our girls. They went down to Huntsville and had an amazing time. We did local interactions with space journalists from CNN and other publications. We even put up 24 of our finalists on a billboard in Times Square for a week with a tagline that said, let's talk gender equity in space. And furthermore, just this past fall, we had a private roundtable session with the US ambassador to the UN with all 24 of our finalists. And the girls were speaking to her about the importance of space as it relates to the SDGs and educating this international leader about how the work that all of us are doing matters so much to the future of our planet. And it's, it's been a humbling journey to see the way in which this contest has expanded. Um, we've done contests now in Paris and Portugal, hoping to do more very soon. And we also have a free education uh, curriculum, space education curriculum, 
that we're beginning to distribute to teachers and students across the globe. And we're also working to conduct workshops leveraging this curriculum to get everyone excited about this message. And we haven't started talking too much about this yet, but you guys will be the first to know that we are now working to do an all-girls camp in New York City next year, a large base camp with astronauts and all kinds of fun shenanigans. And we're so excited to be able to carry out this message and get young women excited about making a true contribution to the global space economy. So that's a little summary of what we do. Uh, and I, it's been a joy for me to be able to not only watch these girls surprise themselves and feel so empowered, but watch them inspire their communities. All of our winners are turned into local ambassadors and have continued to carry the torch of the values and missions that we've tried to instill through them through our contest. So it's so great to be able to share this message with you guys and happy to be here. Bravo and well done. And I had the privilege of being a Space Prize judge. Uh, I had the amazing privilege of mentoring a student for about half the year. Um, she loves space, but she also loves dentistry. And so it was fun to, uh, to partner with Bailey and figure out, it's like we sat down with a pediatric orthodontist. She's had braces for a long time. So she and Bill sat there and Bill was blown away. So what Kim is doing is really important. And she brought some amazing girls that participated. So even more will, I am sure, in the future. All right, Christine, tell, tell us what you do. Hello, everyone. Um, it's such an honor to be here and um, follow up my amazing colleagues. I'm really glad I didn't immediately follow either of you two up because I had to contain myself a little bit. Um, so I am a longtime uh, space educator and ambassador, and space has been just such an amazing lever for me to be able to reach students that I think would otherwise be um, un- interested in science. And most of my students were actually uninterested in academia at all. My goal when I was tasked with my group of students initially was let's just get them graduating high school. And my kids did amazing things. Um, so I am the chair of the US Astronomy Education Coordination Team and I had the privilege last year of serving in, ooh, didn't mean to go that far, um, serving in Congress writing education policy in the office of Representative Grijalva as a, an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow. Um, I am a planetary scientist for funsies, and I am almost ABD in my STEM education PhD doctoral journey. Um, but my journey really started with Krista McAuliffe. Um, I always loved space. I wanted to work in space, and when the Challenger, I just dated myself, sorry y'all, um, when the Challenger capsule exploded, um, I saw, well, I guess I can't be an astronaut because that was the woman I saw in space and I guess I can't do that. And I really quelled any desire I had to work in space for many, many, many years um, because the only way I knew that I could do that would be to be an astronaut. And after that, I didn't really want to do that anymore. So I pursued music. I was actually a music major. I put off taking any science until I absolutely had to, until it became time to actually graduate and get a bachelor's degree. I took geology and it completely rocked my world. All the puns. So starting in 2004, um, I became an educator and I wanted to use geology, the earth sciences, the environmental sciences, to be able to make science contextualized to students who may not otherwise see the relevance of it in their lives, see the meaning in explaining the phenomenons that are around them, um, the world that they lived in, because that's what it did for me. Um, when I began, began teaching in the classroom, um, which I really didn't want to do for a long time, but realized that that was my calling because I was the type of student that needed a teacher like the one I became. So that was really what I was tasked with. So I began teaching high school, um, and it turned out that earth and space sciences, which I'll get to in just a moment, um, were not this high-level elective that I think we all wish it would be to feed into the astronaut program and the space economy. Um, so I've been a college professor teaching astronomy to teachers and community college students for the last eight years. Um, and I've had the privilege of teaching to um, refugee families in Slovakia, Ukrainian families, and also to students um, in Southeast Asia. Come on. Um, so through all of this, students have really been my driver. Um, I've been able to use astronomy to travel all over the world as an astronomy ambassador to Chile. Um, I got the chance to fly aboard a space mission, the SOFIA mission, and I've conducted um, international astronomy education research. 
Um, and what I really see my place as being is being able to utilize and leverage STEM as a gateway, but probably not in the way that is generally talked about in the space economy, where we talk about um, building the space workforce by targeting adults or targeting undergraduates or targeting high school. My mission starts a bit earlier. Um, I've always kind of pushed the grain. Um, I raced competitive mountain bikes for a bit, and there was nothing for women. So I started the first ever uh, women's um, professional mountain biking team, um, and that kind of fed into what I've done as an educator. Um, I then always was seeking other ways to bring space into my classes, so I had the opportunity to fly on the SOFIA mission. My students then became the youngest authors of a SOFIA proposal an all-girl team. I got to travel to Chile as an astronomy ambassador, which was also amazing, and I brought a lot of those Im that imagery back to my classes and developed a remote astronomy program where my students were then using robotic telescopes um, to be able to study space. But this all really started with um, a high-altitude balloon project, which was a pretty incredible thing. Um, I started the first student space symposium, which, um, hint, hint, wink, wink, shameless plug, I am looking to develop into a national program. Um, and if you look really closely, we lived uh, very close to JPL. I am a transplant out here from Southern California. Um, there are many different um, JPL head figures in there. And this guy, um, I did my second master's based on his research. He was the, um, the director of the Dawn mission. Um, I then pushed him to, he was, if you've ever met this guy, Mark Raymond, he is the funniest um, person on the planet. He now is this leading outreach specialist. Well, my students were the first ones that he spoke to because I heard him speaking at something just like this, and I was like, you have to talk to my students. And he said, I don't do that. Um, but I pushed him, and now he does, and that's like his, his main gig. So um, we, have, we have remained really good friends. Um, but back in the day, um, I had a student ask me if they would be able to collect cosmic dust, because we'd been talking about cosmic dust as I was getting my second master's in planetary science. I brought that immediately into my classes um, because I felt like they needed to know all of this really cool stuff that I was learning. And um, I had a student that asked me if we could collect cosmic dust on a high altitude balloon. Um, my answer was, I don't know, let's find out. So um, I spent an entire weekend, wrote a grant, got all the stuff, learned alongside the students. Um, it all started with that student right there, the one that is observing um, the one with the drill. Um, he is now finishing up at USC his master's degree in mechanical engineering, and he just concluded an internship with Boeing. Many of my students then that were on target to not graduate high school have gone into aerospace fields. And all I did was get out of the way. I can't say that this was anything that I did. Um, they asked a question, and I just kind of let them lead. Yes, they sent up crazy things like scorpions, flan, an egg. I only did that one once. Um, <laughs> but it was just an incredible process to throw away the textbook, throw away the standards, and this was just public high school, um, and to just give them space to direct their learning. Um, but as I really d started diving into this, I started really thinking about, okay, where was my path in this? I didn't go into a space field, and I didn't get an advanced degree in this until I was 30. Um, and if we start to really look at the representation following on from the talk this morning in Earth and Space, we see the fewest number of women and the fewest people of color of any STEM field. And these statistics are pretty staggering. Less than 15% of global astronomers are women, and there are less than 100 PhDs granted to African-American women, ever. I don't mean this year. And the non-white PhD representation in astronomy is hovering between one and 5%. Someone I was speaking to at lunch said, I think it's actually five people. And the International Astronomical Membership is only 21% of women, but that is changing. The youngest demographic is now 49% women, so we are seeing a shift. However, the rationale for this doesn't start with workforce development, and it doesn't start in high school. It starts earlier than that. If we look at the, glo or the national representation of people of color, we see that nationally, over a quarter of the nation is people of color, but we see less than 11% of people of color in STEM. We can, we can relate this directly back to early access to science. There are less than 60% of students in poor communities that have access to physics. In the state of Arizona, I know this because I represented an Arizona congressman last year, there are less than 50 physics teachers in the entire state. That's staggering because our field is dependent on having access to physics. And this directly falls along demographic lines. So right here, the National Academies, I had the opportunity to work with them last year when I was on the Hill, and they published this lovely 77-page document, which I highly recommend, called the Call to Action for Science Education, and they specifically call out the role of early access to equitable, quality science education in order to mitigate 
these issues that we see and these opportunity gaps represented in the field now. So what their findings stated was that the substantial disproportionate opportunity gaps exist in early access. And elementary school is critical. If we want to mitigate these disproportionate gaps later on, we have to look earlier than when people have already self-selected these places within college and career. At that point, the moment for STEM identity and STEM identification has changed and has passed. So students generally identify with the STEM field prior to eight years old, not eighth grade. But if you look at most policy and practices, they are targeted at eighth grade and above. We missed the point. We will never change that demographic or that diversity. We have to think earlier. So if we look at resources, qualified teachers, and the educator workforce, we're not targeting early education. If we look at just resources and access, we can see that there are clear, and this is from the National Academy's Call to Action, this, is, this was a huge team of people that put together this data, that nationally, on average, students get less than 60 minutes or I'm sorry, 20 minutes per day of science. But if we look at our poor communities, over 60% of those students don't get any science until seventh grade. Think about that. My students, my children, did not get science until seventh grade, which is crazy. Um, if you wanted to um, look at a synopsis of that, um, last year I wrote an article called Hardwired to Learn, um, but left out of the landscape, and this is really a summary and a call to action and a policy paper addressing the call to action and a call to policymakers to be able to provide this access to early science. But we can also see this directly reflected in our access to Earth and space education. So we talk about needing this global workforce in space, but there's no AP course in Earth science or space. It is the lowest level science in most states. Where I came from in California, we did not accept this as a college graduation requirement or a college acceptance requirement until a year ago. And schools have to go through an incredible process in order to get that. So this was the class, whether it was Earth or space, that students were funneled into if they needed to just barely pass high school. But then we have it as a high level class in college. So there's, there's a gap there. So you're only getting students that have had extracurricular access. It is not, so it wasn't counted towards university admission. You have the lowest number of credentialed teachers. There are less than 5%, 5% of national teachers that are qualified to teach Earth in space. It is very low. There is no preparation program for teachers to teach this content whatsoever. Most, like me, um, pursued on their own time and dime the ability to be able to learn this. Um, there is a lack, the research that I just conducted with 63 um, participants from 23 different nations showed that even Spanish, there is not a grade level Spanish curriculum um, in, uh, in astronomy. So a teacher in Mexico has had to write his own book because it doesn't actually exist in Spanish, the second most common language in the world, which is pretty crazy. And grade level text, when I was teaching high school, I had to use things from college because it didn't exist. So if we limit that opportunity until university, um, we can see why these policies and practices that are targeting older learners are going to consistently fall short. But there's hope. In 2012, the National Research Council um, promoted the Next Generation Science Standards, which to date 44 states have adopted and implemented. So this consists of a robust suite of Earth and Space Science Standards. So every student in every state, a quarter of all of their science, will now be anchored in Earth and Space systems. And these systems include this robust integration of the cryosphere, geosphere, atmosphere, all of it comprised together so students see the working interactions between Earth and space and all of the different systems systems that impact their daily lives. And this is a critical opportunity that we have to be able to bring this robust and um, really equitable, accessible science to students everywhere. Um, but to date, there is no program to train teachers to do this. So it really just stands as the latest reform effort. And um, that is something that I am hoping to change by being able to train teachers to be able to bring this in a meaningful way to their students. So I leave you here with um, a photo that my students took aboard a high-altitude balloon in conjunction with a French documentarian, hence the French scared Lego. We did recover that one. That is Southern California. That was featured in a documentary um, to combat flat earth. Um, this was presented to the Flat Earth Society. They didn't buy it, by the way. Um, I would love to collaborate. Um, there is my contact information. Thank you. How about a big round of applause?
And many of you may be going, I see why Janet invited Christine, because she is preaching something that I have been stamping my feet about pretty much my entire space education career. Back in 2006, Time Magazine published an article that said looking for um, kind of like a, a lab coat idol. Uh, at that time, American Idol was all the rage. And in it, even then, it was saying that if you don't get them by fourth grade, unless there is an incredible mentor that happens upon them, it is potential that you will never get them interested in STEM or space. So here's what I'm going to invite you guys to do. Please think of these things. Um, when you're talking about the schools that don't have access to space, the silver lining of the pandemic is that there's a rural school about five minutes from my house, and they called me in October of 2020 and said, Janet, we've got to have a PBL. We've got to have something. We don't know where to start. Can you create something and come in and, and, and you know, <coughs> facilitate it? So starting in October 2020, masked up, this rural school was still meeting, and we did a Mars Habitat uh, project. And to see where they came the next you know, spring and all the things that they had done. I've now done that. I'm heading into my fourth year this fall. And we continue to do that, but it's in my backyard. And often people go, well, what can I do, Janet? You can support any of these missions here. Please get to know these people. But you can also do it bloom where you're planted. What I've appreciated about so many of you is that I know I've interrupted so many conversations here going, hey, I've got students over here. Do you mind going and talking to them? So I pretty much did that to everybody, so thank you. Uh, but it's important, and what I have loved seeing is how you guys light up sharing your story to your future benefactors of all of your knowledge bank. So I hope that this inspires you to go home or meet these people, start your own thing, let's create a consortium. But I want to open it up now to questions. Uh, for any of you out there, for all of these lovely folks, uh, please make your way to the microphones if you have any questions for Julia about her work in the Ukraine or Lee in Latin America or what Kim is doing with Space Prize or how you can kind of connect with Christine. So I see some people moving to the microphone and I know him. Kevin, what is your question? Um, I had a question for Lee about his documentary, if he was intending to release it anywhere else other than the Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, so uh, Kennedy is, is the first screening of it. We have a bunch of folks who are interested in helping us distribute uh, the project, um, the, the documentary series, and um, I will keep you posted. Um, I uh, am very much hoping that this will help raise awareness for everything we're doing, and actually a good chunk of the proceeds from this uh, documentary series is going right back into the nonprofit project. So um, yeah, I'll keep you posted on that one. But thank you. Yeah, great question. Lucas. Hi, I have a question for Christine. Do you know what are the six um, states that have not signed on to that act uh, about prioritizing like Earth systems? Like um, yes, I happen to live in one of them, Virginia. I don't know the other five. I just know that I, I moved from a lead state to a non-adopter. Okay. Um, I think Arkansas is another one. I'm not sure of, of the others. Okay, thank you. Those are my students. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions or comments? All right. I'll do this. Um, hi, Crystal Puga. I'm a um, um, mission architect with Northrop Grumman, and I've, I've had the privilege of being able to do a lot of STEM programs at my company. They've, they've been very supportive from developing high school competitions, high school internship programs, um, and it's, it's been very great. I, I think industry plays a big part in this. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we need that STEM, you know, flow of students to come and work for us eventually, right? So we're the, we're the receivers of all of your guys' good work. Um, but I feel that sometimes industry, we, we take the problem on, on ourselves 
because sometimes we don't feel like there's enough support out there um, to try to engage students, which is, which is great. It means that these big companies are engaging with the community. But in reality, there's only so much that we can do on our own, and it really, it really does require a lot more support. So my question to the panel is, um, you know, how can industry, who's going to benefit from your education, how can we partner, what ideas do we have uh, to kind of make this a more uh, cohesive approach, and not just educators trying to bring STEM up and industry trying to bring STEM up, but do it together? So I want to hear from my panel, but a long time I have been um, promoting the idea of creating either a consortium or a place where we house all this stuff and creating a group of folks who like, hey, let's, let's run this Mars Innovation Challenge along with Northrop Grumman, right? Or let's do one of these space prize, let's partner with Northrop Grumman. What do you guys think? I think that there's already something that Northrop Grumman does, which, which is the teacher, um, the fellowship that you guys have, where teachers spent three weeks, and but it's targeted state by state. And the benefit of targeting a teacher is you have to think about exponentially how many students are, are met by that. So every teacher has minimum 250 students a year. So you have a 10-year teacher, that's 2,500 students. Teachers are then going to talk to other teachers and spread the word. Like when I started doing my high altitude balloon project, I brought easily 10 other teachers just in our state um, and then wrote the curriculum for the entire state of California. So now every teacher in California can do that. So you reach a teacher, you reach a, a bunch of more students. But I would challenge industry, again, to, to not just think about the, the later educators. Be willing to engage with early learning. Yeah. Did I see somebody else move to the microphone? Oh. We'll take one more question, and then I want to introduce you to... Uh, but there was a tie with our Mars Innovation Challenge, and you're going to meet two uh, young men, and they're going to present their idea. Yes, good sir. Uh, I'm uh, this one. I'm Ron Turner. I'm with the NIAC program, and I'm not talking about something that I had anything to do with. Rather, our outreach coordinator Kathy Riley had everything to do with um, in the NASA program, and we, you know, also she has a fantastic. Um, perspective on trying to reach down to the young children and, and, and bring them up and get them interested. And NIAC, we fund those really crazy ideas that, you know, uh, you know, if they work, they'll change the future, but they probably won't, so we, you know, have to <laughs> mitigate it that way. But she's worked with, with um, museums uh, to do science fiction to science fact. And it's always so fascinating when she, we invite our fellows in to do an afternoon or an evening or a weekend session at these museums. And it's the little kids that just line the hall, you know, asking the questions. And um, it's always so inspiring to us to see the enthusiasm. But we also have teamed with World Book in this series mm -hmm. called Out of This World. And in Out of This World, it's aimed for maybe a little bit older than what you guys are looking to push. It's sixth grade to eighth grade, but they're very accessible. And each book is focused on one fellow that we funded, and we've got a diverse group of fellows that we, that we pick. We've done uh, 16 books, and, and eight more are in, in works, and, and they go to the elementary schools, and each, each one is not just about what the fellow does, but the history of what inspired the fellow. And so I encourage you to look into this World Book Out of This World series to see if you can use that as a way to, you know, help show that there are people like you who do science and who do, so, who do math. And, you know, it, it's really a great... Um, it, it's really a great outreach, and again, it's not something that I did in the program. Kathy Riley um, is really the brains behind it, but I encourage you to look into that. Thank you so much, Ron. We'll take your question, and then we'll bring out the gentleman students who won. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Esther. I'm program executive with NASA headquarters, and um, I've been quite involved in the equity efforts that NASA is doing in an agency and science mission directorate level. A lot of our efforts have been focused on expanding dual anonymous peer review, uh, making the data available, um, all of our earth science data available in multiple languages on common platforms. Um, and so, what you're bringing to to our attention is that it needs to go earlier. And so, I just want to know what are your suggestions? Um, one, how to reach uh, the 
the younger students, but also how to reach the educators from a standpoint of what maybe what we're already doing, um, but maybe some new ideas that we can incorporate. Um, talking about some new ideas, maybe I know that uh, lots of efforts are focused on public schools, but lots and lots of people in informal education would be very willing to engage with you, homeschoolers, private schools, museums, as mentioned before, and so on. So I would really uh, suggest that you reach out to those people. And I just wanted to share, uh, yesterday I was teaching a group of kids, of 10-year-old kids, um, we mostly focus on 10 to 14 year olds to answer your questions about the age we're focusing on. And one 10 year old girl said that every time I turn on the water, I think how it looks like on other planets. Nice. Anybody else want? Yeah, Christine. You know, a, a real easy partnership, I mean, nothing is easy, but um, would be looking at pre-service education programs because preparation for teachers at the primary level and the secondary level are very different. At the secondary level, you're a content specialist. So you teach biology, you get a biology degree. Elementary, you're more of a behavioralist. And most of those teachers at max take one science class and it's you know cramming everything into one. So that lack of, of confidence in science directly translates to the access that students get. So being able to provide educators with opportunities to learn more but making it easy on them because educators are just especially coming out of the pandemic they are beyond at a max um, but being able to partner and provide something for teachers in pre-service programs where they get more of a robust access to learning about NASA data like I teach in the the Endeavor STEM program and I, I teach space science to teachers um, and it's the first time that they've ever learned anything but moon phases and seasons because that's generally all that gets taught in elementary school because that's all the teacher was taught. The other thing is, it's gotta be easy to find. When I was underneath the NASA Next Gen STEM grant during the pandemic, one of the things that I told uh, eventual headquarters is, you've got great curriculum, but I have to know what I'm looking for to find it. So if you're creating curriculum and it's this, for a teacher that if you wanna engage them, especially K through five, because there's too much going on, you've got to make it clear. Bam, I found it. It's easy, it explains everything and how I need to do it. So we will talk, Elizabeth. Will you give my wonderful panel a big round of applause? I'm going to let them, yes, thank you.